And we have Amber Tim taking minutes. And then my alternate is Brandon Dyson. So if I'm not here, Brandon will be at the table. So if everybody else could explain who their alternates are, so we make sure we're clear on that, if you have any. So currently, Blue Floor is possibly. Um, and we, when we get into the uh, ground rules, we're going to see if we could change, like to three members instead of four members for minimal. Okay. Well, let's uh, start with then item number two on the agenda, discussion and adoption of the ground rules. And I'll uh, let Teresa kick that off. So I simplified what we did last time because last time they were intended to be a new agreement with we're all going to put our issues on the table. I think we're in a better place this time. So I'll take any um, changes anybody might have to the ground rules. Um, so section A. Um, at the bottom, um, three minimal members for a buck is what we would like. I know we had listed four there. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing where you're talking. Sentence, it's the, it's the mm -hmm. last sentence. Section I. Uh, a. Paragraph A. And then oh, okay. So A. three members of SAPOC's team are present. Okay. Yeah. All right. Did we have any other changes yes. that anybody want to make? Um, number eight, we wanted to discuss this with you all. Um, num uh, section eight, um, paragraph <coughs> A, um, SAPOC agrees that it will not. Um, we we do agree that we should not be negotiating with city council or the city manager, but we do have other things going on. Um, so the, we there may be times where we will be contact or discussing things with these personnel listed, but uh, we're not going to negotiate with them because we, we recognize that y'all are the negotiation party. Last year, we had a, a couple of minor hiccups because we had some things ha going on at the same time negotiations were happening, and we actually had council people reach out to us asking us about the negotiations. So, um, yeah, I can send out an email to them to remind them that that's not appropriate for them to reach out to you guys because the ground rules indicate that you can't discuss anything we're negotiating at the table. Did you want to change that language or you just want to make sure it's clear? We, we just want, we want to remove contact or discuss. We'll, we'll agree with negotiate or attempt to negotiate, but contacting and discussing. Well, I mean, this is limited only to issues that have been put on the table or may be put on the table. So I don't think we want you contacting or discussing them any issue that's on the table or would be on the table. So it's not including anything else that's not being discussed here. So that second sentence um, is qualifying what you can't contact, discuss, negotiate, or attempt to negotiate with them. So if you want to contact them about something we're not talking about here, that's still well, going to be allowed. We, we understand that part, but we want to be able to talk with them about whatever we want to talk about. We're, we agree we won't negotiate or, or attempt to negotiate. I'm, but. I'm not in favor of that. There should be no contact with council members or the city manager about anything that's talked at this table. The issue is this is meet and confer. It's not collective bargaining. Neither side <coughs> has a statutory responsibility to negotiate in good faith. And it's all permissive. Now, if an elected official for the city of San Angelo or the city manager contacts our president and says, hey, how's everything going? Then by this ground rule, he can't even discuss it with them. He can say, it's going great, we all get along and love each other, and we're moving right along down the road. He just can't say, well, we're really disappointed in the pay proposal that the city's providing to us, because I do believe that is negotiation. Yeah, but he can get And I, I believe even though there may not lying. be a statutory right, we're here under good faith that we're going to negotiate in good faith. 
Yes, ma'am, I'm making the assumption both sides will too, but there is no, there is no punishment if either side does it. I think that's the reason we're putting this in there, though. And we're putting it in there on both sides. Like, we're, we're not, we're also going to hold ourselves by that same standard in the next item. The next item says that we can go back and discuss, otherwise we can't come to an agreement because we have no authority to agree on anything. So we'll carry forward to council anything that comes from the table. Yeah, that comes from the table. But I don't believe that this limits you from contacting them on other things, which is initially what the concern that was raised was. I do not think it's appropriate for you to be contacting or discussing anything that's discussed at the table. So is the city manager the head of your team? Like your decisions go through him, correct? Um, Michael is the representative from the fourth floor on our team. Okay. So the city manager is not considered a team member. We would not go to Daniel unless there is something that we need his authorization for. Okay. And he and I had a conversation on Friday about that, that I know you guys meet with him and that it's not appropriate for him to raise topics, nor is it appropriate to discuss things that we're discussing at the table. And he clarified what was on our agenda to be discussed. Okay. Okay, and that will we'll concur. We'll agree with that term for now. So Is that everything for the ground rules? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with that item being closed then, I guess, do we need to take a motion or anything on that? So are you guys okay approving with just that one change of four to three, or do you want to discuss it further? Because we really can't move on unless we have ground rules in place. We're okay to move on. Okay. So last time we executed the ground rules with like a hand edit. Are you okay doing that this time as well? Yes. Okay. All right, so on this edit, I've crossed out four on that section IA and made it three, and there are no other changes to the ground rules. So if you're okay with that, we'll go ahead and let Brian sign, and then Noel, if you'll sign. Amber, if you could make copies of that, not right now, but after the meeting and send them out to both sides, that would be great. Thank you. All righty, with uh, item two uh, being completed, we'll move on to item three, discussion and possible action of the following items, and we'll move to uh, sub-item A, offers officer incentives for recruitment. Actually, on that one, when I talked to Daniel on Friday, he's already come to an agreement, I believe, with the chiefs on that item, so we can remove that item from the table. Okay, so we'll remove item A and move on to item, sub-item B, so 3B, amending rules to allow at laterals with basic certification. <clears throat> that is in page six of the current meet and confer agreement. <coughs> I also took the liberty on Friday of drafting what I believe to be the changes we wanted to make on these items. Um, and on this one, there were a couple, of course, we'll change the date. Um, on section two, there was a discussion of wanting to allow basic peace officer certification on lateral hires. Um, 
And then on section three, we had entry level pay, which made sense under the old pay structure, but under this new pay structure, it's a little unclear in the current agreement. So we went ahead and said that reflects the officer's certification level. So everyone will come in as a police officer, but if they're a master's police officer, they'll come in at the master police officer level. I believe that was all the changes I had on that section. On the uh, copy I have uh, on section one, there's a misspelling. It's got uh, commissioned officers or later transfers, and I think it needs to be lateral. Lateral, okay. Section, section one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, it looks like there's two section twos. Oh, you yeah. guys! That are might just need me. to be adjusted. <laughs> section two. Okay, so the next one's three. And in the first, in the first section two, there's two uh, section Ds. <clears throat> two section Ds. We just need five. Six should be five. Is that what you're saying, Tina? The section six should be uh, section five. One, two, three. Yeah, there's also two section fours. Oh, you got I will fix all that. Yeah, I think we can go through and we'll just, we'll just count that as I some I don't know. House. I just copied and pasted these from last time. Why were you not so sticklers last time? Some right, housekeeping one, two, that we'll, we'll get to. Okay, so we're agreed on... Article 3, Section 3B, though, that uh, the changes that that uh, Teresa spoke about, are we good on that? We agreed all the changes for Article 3 for the hiring process. Okay. okay. So if you'll agree to handwritten edits on these, including changing all the numbers to the appropriate digits. I would like to remind everybody I had COVID brain last week, so numbers were beyond me. Um, I have this one ready for TA signature. So that actually took care of B and C on our list. So we're we're good with section four as well, or or is that? Yeah, you A and B. So A, a and B. Okay. Yeah, B and C. I mean, B and C are both. With section four A, Article three, section four A, we're we're good with that too. Is that an so. agreement that we just signed? Which one is it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, modifying the compensation language. That's in the one we just signed. That's right okay. here. Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, so that took care of item 3B and 3C. We'll move on to 3D, modifying probationary period for police recruit language. <laughs> this was a suggested correction by um, Christine adding the word recruit under section two, so it would now read non TCOL certified applicants who are hired as police recruits by SAPD will serve a probationary period of 18 months from the date of employment as a police recruit by the SAPD. Under the prior language, it was a little bit confusing at what point the um, 18 months started, whether it was time of hire or whether it was after they completed the academy. So we just wanted to, I mean, we all knew what that meant, but we wanted to make sure the language reflected it. Clarify. Yep. So we have a suggestion, um, and it's just based on a current situation we're in. We have currently hired um, two police recruits, but they're not going to get to start the academy maybe until next year. They're right now they're in dispatch, and we were wondering about the language if we changed it to 12 months from the swear date, because at this point, 
these cadets, by the time they get out of the academy and get their training complete, they're going to be pretty much off probation before we get a chance to assess them. So we're wondering about possibly a language change 12 months from swear to date. Um, 18 months works normally, but it's, it should still technically be 18 months. Um, but so from with, state of swearing in. Yeah, yeah really it would also uh, affect people who are recycled in an academy for injury or something like that so that they remain probationary, they remain probationary for that second academy because otherwise by the time they're on the street in training they'll they'll likely be civil service because in essence the whole time they're in the academy they're technically on probation anyway right they don't have civil service protection yeah yeah i think we want to caucus and discuss this one with the chiefs okay. if that's okay yeah. all right brian so if you could take us off the record while we caucus. 852 we're back from the caucus uh, the chiefs are all okay with that change so again if you're okay with doing a hand draft Correction, we can go ahead and get this one TA too. There you go. You can take it over there. So the way I've modified it to say a probationary period of 12 months from the date of swearing in as a police officer by the SAPD. It does make it the same as laterals as well. So. Okay, we'll move on to <coughs> item 3E, removing assessment centers for promotions where the same number or more vacancies exist as there are candidates. And also F, if you could read that one. And also F, modifying the assessment center scoring language. They're both found in article four, page seven and nine. So now that we have an assessment center under our belt, there were a couple of things that popped up that um, Christine wanted to um, modify if we could. So the first one is on page three of this agreement and it has to do with what's on the screen actually, the total maximum points. Um, the way it was written before, the total maximum points would be 100. And she was like, why did we do it this way? And I'm going to throw Jeremy under the bus. There was a note on a document from Jeremy that made us correct it. So we put it back to 110 so that um, you could get more than 100 maximum points. But I don't really understand the reasoning. But I don't remember the reasoning of why we changed it to 100. So we wanted to put it back and see if anybody wanted to keep it back or if we want to leave that as 100 maximum. So our issue is that um, if you have it as 110, you're penalizing those with less seniority on the score instead of having bonus points for uh, seniority points. Because if you only have five years, you get a five out of 10, in, and it's going to lower your score as compared to the, the math actually maths to make an actual numerical difference um, of if somebody has, has five seniority points and you add them as bonus points versus five seniority points out of a, ten, out of a possible 10 points on the denominator side. That's why essentially I, I tried to clarify it that um, you could go over 100 points and have maximum exam points of 100 out of 100, maximum seniority points of 10 out of zero, and then a, a total maximum score of 110 out of 10. And that's what y'all prefer for it to go back to 110 or no? Well, or do you want the, you want the seniority points to come in at a different point in the process? Like after we do the, the math on the next section where it's written exam points plus seniority points times 0.40. So really, I mean, 
on the calculation on the paper, it's total maximum points on the written exam times 0.40 adjustment factor. Is that not where you want the seniority points to be added in? It, it will be total points on the written exam plus, well, the seniority points are factored in on, on your score on the written exam. Yeah. And then it's factored by 0.4. Yeah, and so that's what that's reflecting right there. Right, but it gives a limitation. The, the current system gives a limitation of 100 maximum points, including seniority points. Right. Um, what you're proposing, or what, what was proposed, it would be giving a maximum of 10 out of 10, which would make the total maximum points 110, which is different because if you say you get a score of a 90 and you have 10 seniority points, you get 100. Well, 100 divided by 110 is 0.91. One. One. Yeah. But if you have a maximum of 110 out of 100 and you get that same score, you would have a, a 100 instead of a 0.91. So it might just be a conversation then of leaving it the way it's written currently and you having a conversation with Christine on how it should be calculated. We, well, did, we did that on our current. Okay. Yeah. Currently we have one testing uh, applicant per lieutenant that is not, but he, it's the first time that I know it's happened, but tested so high that he's not going to be able to capitalize on his inward points. Mm -hmm. So. He's actually losing. He actually should be number one mm -hmm. on the list with his seniority points, but because he's buffered up to that point, everybody else can catch well, him. Well, he's he's still number one, but yeah. uh, he he lost a point essentially. Yes. He lost one of his seniority points, right? Um, because and and it was our intent the whole time to for it to be you get ten bonus points and you can go over a hundred. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you're you're taking a, a score out of seniority points instead of them being a bonus for for people who have them. So how do we fix it in the language? Because putting the total maximum points at 100 caused confusion, so that's not the fix. This is yeah. Well, I think based on that's why I built the the slide the way it is, mm -hmm. is so that it's maximum. It, it it lays out exactly what your maximum scores are, and it, and it changes points on total maximum to score. So you get the maximum exam points, maximum seniority points, and then total. So if I just write it, if I add in to the on the TA, on the maximum exam points, put 100 out of 100, maximum seniority points, 100 out of zero, and the total maximum score, 110 out of 100, that will fix it. So if I could change the, to look like that. Could you repeat that? Sorry. So, it makes, can I come over there? Yeah. Show you. Mm -hmm. your, you know, divisors up there. Right. So if I just put that 100 out of 100, 110 out of zero, and then 110 out of 100, and then put this out of 100, and this out of 100, does that fix it for me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 it's not ready to sign. All right, so we're just going to make it reflect on the sheet like it shows right there. And I think at some level we're saying the same thing. It's just not coming out that way. Yeah, I think for our part, we just want to make sure mm -hmm. we're clear on it. Yeah. So the other change, um, 
on this one, we added the section five. You know, it's a very expensive process and it's something we want to keep, but we don't want to do it unnecessarily. So the proposed language is the assessment center process shall not be required in the event the number of vacancies for the rank equals the number of candidates. So if there's not going to be anybody who's going to lose, we're not going to play. Okay. And I believe that was all the changes on that um, assessment center TA. Does anybody have any other suggestions or comments? I think, I think we're good with the uh, proposed change. Oh, where? Oh, or does not exceed? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, that's a good change. So we're, instead of equals, we're going to write does not exceed the number of candidates. So like Mike said, if it's less. Is there any process which can be bypassed to expedite the execution of the promotions? You mean In other if, words, if, if, if instead of going through some week long process, in the event we have three openings and two candidates? I mean, you'd still have you'd still have their ability. You'd just have the civil service test, and then you'd have uh, their the promotional exam and then their ability to challenge the questions and then yeah. that'd be it. That's important. Sergeant section four. Okay. And I guess those scores have an impact, potential impact in the future. Yeah, those scores is, it will be how you base the seniority. Yeah, that was We also capitalized a sergeant that was not capitalized. Okay, if you want to take a look at this, no. Okay, so that concludes 3D and E and F. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, E and F, sorry. Mm -hmm. E and F. Um, now we're moving on to item 3G, reinstating maximum limit for longevity. Uh, we believe this was just a, an error that was made last time that we didn't intend um, to get in there. Um, <clears throat> So I think it was 20 years before, or? Wait, what's the whole city on? 20. On that? So, then yeah. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are y'all good with that change to move that back to 20? Yes, we, yes. we understand it was a uh, just an oversight on the last one. Yes. Um, it's it's appendix I or one, sorry. We don't have a formal TA, so do we no, want to bring that back? Christine about that. So we we can bring the TA back next time on that, or since it's part of the pay schedule, if this changes at all, we can bring it all back at once. We'll just know that we have a tentative agreement at the table, not in writing, to change that back to 20 yeah. years. And we'll verify that it's 20 years to okay. give us that. So. Okay. Well, that concludes item three. We'll move on to item no, 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 we four. Still more. We have um, I, we have other items that people want to consider. Yeah. Discussion of other items is what I was doing for. Okay, that's perfect. Okay. He's Discussion going. of other items to be considered.
not your pay proposal because that's we're going to give that its own section. But is there anything else in the basic language of the agreement that anybody wanted to talk about? Or I know we all had the training with Julie last week. Is there anything that that spurred that we might want to start kicking around? How much does uh, how much does it cost the city when y'all have to run a recruitment test for us? Do y'all have an idea on that calculation? Uh, I don't. Uh, okay. We'd have to. Uh, I mean, I'd have to get with Christine. We could put uh, a number to it, I'm sure, but or yeah. at least a ballpark number to I'm it. I'm just I'm just wondering, and I mean, this is not something that's do or die but i think that abilene got a little creative with their hiring process since they're also uh 20 personnel down where they're allowing like open testing um but like the the trainer last week suggested there are things that we could waive um with meeting converg on track to make it easier um for Hiring, and I, I don't really know what the city's position would be on maybe waiving the civil service test and just letting them apply, um, do a physical assessment, and go to background, or if you would like to continue the civil service test as is. Um, we're just trying to think outside the box on things that could possibly help us recruit faster than what we have. And nothing that has to be decided today, obviously, but just these are ideas. Did you all have, I mean, other than like doing away with the civil service exam completely, did you have any other ideas? Do you like the way Abilene's doing it? I mean, some people just have a computer. I don't know. So the problem with me suggesting we go to Appoint is I don't know what they're paying in cost. If they're having, they're doing proctored testing. So they have like a hiring block, mm -hmm. uh, like October 1st to December 1st. That's their hiring block. And people are just randomly going into these testing centers and taking the test. And they're ranked, not, they're ranked on their test score. Um, but they're and not so the having list to, shifts constantly, like yeah, she was saying. But yeah. it's I don't know what the cost is on that. I'm just trying to think of ways that we could possibly be a little bit more creative mm -hmm. on our the laterals. I think we're good. They can walk in the door and test, do a physical assessment test, and and then we can send them to background. But for uh, recruits straight, straight off the street. I'm just trying to think if there's something y'all have thought of that might might actually help. I don't know that waiving the test is a good idea. I'm not right. suggesting we need to do that, but if it costs us money, um, we're going to be able to figure out if they can read and write and do math pretty quick in a background. So I don't know that that civil service test is actually something that we want to continue or should be considered, you know, waiving it. I don't know. I mean, I think it's definitely something both sides should think about and maybe bring back next time as yeah. if you have any options. Yeah, if you're asking whether or not we could do like ad hoc civil service tests with our current staffing, we wouldn't be able to. Um, yeah. But, um, I mean, that doesn't mean that that's not something that might might be somewhere we need to get to. We'd probably have to get another FTE to be able to actually facilitate that. But Yeah. Um, I know I, that there's a former chief, the last time I was at the Civil Service con uh, Conference, there was a former chief who started a business where it's an online testing service, I think, and he it's proctored by being an online test, kind of like universities are doing. Um, I guess we get to decide through our meet and confer process what proctored is. I mean, if it's just a computer in the corner of HR where they go in there, they take a test, and they get it scored electronically. I mean, there's lots of options, but I think if it's something you want us to put some creative energy to, we can certainly add it to the list. It's something that I think we should at least consider. It's definitely not a... Uh, I think it's more... I think it's a benefit to both sides. Mm -hmm. um, if we're able to openly recruit like year round and not have to wait on a test date 
particularly. I just don't know. Uh, I, I'm sure there's something that we have not thought about in this process, but uh, we are limited by our own creativity in this room. So I think that we should consider anything that could help us hopefully overcome this deficit that we're in. This, we're definitely in a deficit. What do we call this? Um, yeah, what are the little groups called that we get together outside the... Uh, <laughs> Those are like subcommittee. Subcommittee, subcommittee. Sub thank you. Subcommittee. I could not come up yeah. with a word. It's Monday morning too early. Yeah. Subcommittee. Um, so is that, I mean, I think that's something that if... It, Obviously, I'm all about whatever we need to do to try to get recruitment numbers up, to get applicant numbers up. I think that, that benefits everybody. Um, so, um, I mean, as long as we still have, a pro obviously, a process where we're trying to select uh, great candidates. So, um, I think that might be something that if you want to reach out to Christine with when you have some, some kind of you know, general idea of what, what what you think might be best, and then maybe we could meet in a subcommittee uh, and uh, before the next uh, meet and confer meeting. But, I'm good with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, we're open to all ideas. I think uh, we got to do something to to spur applicants. So, all right. Is that the only other item under that one? Anything else? Not that I can think of right now. And that's just one that that's on the top of the list, especially after attending that class last week. Okay. So that'll conclude item four. We'll move on to item five, which is discussion of extending the current agreement for one year. Well, this is usually the last thing we do, but none of it becomes effective until it's all done. So I don't see any reason not to go ahead and talk about extending the term. The document that I drafted keeps it at December 31st, 2025. And the reason for that is I think giving that extra space is a good thing. If we leave it at the end of the fiscal year, then we're trying to accomplish all this during the budget, which one, puts meeting pressure, pressure on our folks from finance, and two, it's just a moving target. So being able to discuss these things now, it gives us a better idea of what's out there and what's available and we're not in the rush of budget. So the only change on this document is changing um, the dates commencing on October 1st, 2024, or whatever date we happen to get it into place. It could still be December, um, until December 31st, 2025, as the term for this agreement. And again, we often do this at the end. We can do it at the end if you still want to do it at the end but it's a very simple change if we want to do it now. I don't think the, um, I think that after you see our proposal, then we might get some more clarity on stuff that, um, I, we don't have a problem with it the way it's written though. I just okay. think that it's, uh, we're probably ready to go to the next item and let y'all kind of digest that and see if there's something okay. in there. All right, we can skip this one for now okay, then. So we'll skip item five for right now and move on to item six, discussion of pay and benefits proposal from the association. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sergeant Kennedy and we have a PowerPoint that we'll give you all. Um, to, to let y'all look at some of our ideas. Okay, so Currently, oops, currently we have 153 sworn officers with eight recruits and 19 empty positions. And per the city manager, we are 15% below market average. Uh, we have an inability to attract quality applicants at the rate necessary to replace losses due to attrition. We've been dropping significantly every year. 
Um, our predicted situation, and this is the association's predicted, predicted predictions, is uh, based on known retirements and losses as of 1-1 of 2025, that we will be at 148 sworn officers with eight recruits and 24 empty positions. Uh, in the last five years, we've averaged nine new hires per year. So our proposal is to increase base salaries by 8%, uh, which for a full fiscal year would be right at $1.3 million. Um, but $135,610 of that would go towards positions that are empty. And so that's not actually money that needs to be allocated. Um, with a January, 20, January 1 of 2025 implementation, uh, that reduces the fiscal year cost to 871000 and it would get our average salary to 92% of market. Um, we have a whole lot of numbers on our PTO program because, uh, and this is in, in ordinance and it's been in ordinance for a few years, it costs $61,800 per year uh, for 30, 13 PTOs and six PTSs. Um, that's 80,000 including benefits. They currently get 350 a month for the PTOs and 100 a month for the PTSs. We have nine average hires, so we're averaging training nine per year since 2020, including resignations. Um, so we're moving that we move to $100 a month per PTO and a flat rate of $50 per day that they train someone. And that $50 would also go if the PTO is sick or on vacation and somebody who is not a PTO is training them, um, they, would, they would get that $50 a day. Um, 12 PTOs at $100 a month, it's $14,400, um, cost per recruit, there's 56 training days in a PTO cycle at $50 per day is $2,800, so the cost if we had 14 recruits per year would be $39,000, uh, and assumptions for costs assuming 14 recruits would be a total of $69,591 including benefits. But if we only have nine recruits, it would be 51,414. So the cost for fiscal year 2024 would be 72,253, which is down from the 80,000. Uh, that's based on running the PTO stipend the, current, the same until January 1 of 2025, and then transitioning when we transition everything else. Uh, nighttime differential, we're proposing a dollar an hour for any sworn officer who works at least half their normal workday between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. There's 73 eligible officers, sergeants, and lieutenants. Uh, cost per eligible officer would be $2,080, uh, including benefits just under $200,000 per year. And with the January 1 implementation, it would be $147,856 for this year. Call-out pay versus on-call response pay. Currently, there's no stipend or other monetary benefit for specialized divisions subject to frequent call-out, such as CID, street crimes, motors, Lake and Park, the training division, office professional standards, canine and drone. Uh, proposal to change call-out pay to on-call response pay, which is uh, double time instead of time and a half. For the past, for a 10 and a, 10 and a half month uh, stretch, our call-out pay was at 92873 is the number that we had received from, from the city. Um, so a full year estimated would be 106000 And the cost, if it was uh, double time instead of time and a half, would be 141521 with a difference of 35000 40, almost forty six, including benefits. So if we implemented that January 1, it would cost an estimated 34452 more in uh, fiscal year 24 than, than what we're currently. Uh, a drone stipend, currently we have three drone pilots, but um, it's a unit for four, proposing $100 a month, which is 
6,200 including benefits if, if all four spots are filled. And then uh, fiscal year 24 cost is uh, 4,600. So the total cost picture, um, salaries of 871, thousand night differential of 147 almost 148,000 uh, drone stipend of 4600 on-call response pay of 34,452 makes a total cost of one one million fifty eight thousand the approximate dollars allocated based on a four and a half percent the number we came up with was seven hundred and thirty four thousand six sixty four I'm not sure what the city's num actual number is but it's going to be for four and a half percent pay raise, it's going to be very close to that. Um, we're saving approximately eight thousand from the PTO program, which uh, sets total available at seven seven hundred forty-two thousand. Um, we are proposing that that two hundred eighty-one thousand be offset by uh, empty positions. Currently, an empty position. Of salary savings is seventy thousand six hundred and thirty dollars, and that would utilize four four positions worth of salary savings, and leave a balance of about fifteen hundred dollars. So, question: When you say because we're talking from a budgetary perspective, and I'm certainly not the expert on this, so maybe Michael or or we could ask Jonathan, I guess. Um, but um, are we talking about like not budgeting to fill four positions next fiscal year? We don't believe that there is a, a possibility that we will fill uh, 20, more than 20 positions. So you would leave the, uh, and just clarification, you would leave the FTEs on, on file but not fund those four positions in fiscal year 25. That's what you're suggesting. In other words, you'd, you'd still technically have them on the roster, but they just wouldn't be funded for that fiscal year. Correct. Okay. Would you be opposed to just reducing the FTEs for that year, or the number of officers that were assigned, like in the budget ordinance, reducing yes, that by four? Yes, we'd be opposed to that. Is that the right way to word that question, Michael? Good questions and clear answers. We, we should talk about this more. Okay. I'd like to we, talk with you guys. Okay, so I think we probably need to caucus on this for a little while. Um, um, this, this might be a little longer caucus. We have, um, we also have a PowerPoint spreadsheet that we can provide y'all okay. with a list of rankings and our current uh, officers. So we've got this all on a thumb drive, so y'all can look at it. Okay. So. Yes, we do. <laughs> all right. Uh, then we're going to caucus. No, okay, so we're going to break for caucus at 925, and this might be a little bit longer of a break. All right, we'll call this meeting back to order at 1024. I do have a uh, clarification for something we mentioned earlier. Uh, longevity was a max of 25 years. Is that right, Kim? Longevity was a max of 25 years? Okay, so we got that clear before we leave the meeting. Okay. Um, Michael, do you want to? Sure. We discussed uh, what we saw on the slides. We think that, it, that uh, what you propose merits further discussion. What we'd like is to uh, take uh, and run numbers, come back next meeting, next week, I think, week from tomorrow, and discuss the details and uh, um, work out Work, work that out a little more fully and go from there. We like the, like the philosophy you used to try to pay for this within the, the pool that council's allocated. We want to respect that and, and uh, run the numbers and, and then go through each one of those. It may result in some different numbers. One of the, one of the keys that we've started trying to do is fund 
over time in a proportionate amount when we affect pay. And that was one of the things that they worked through this year in the operating budget was uh, they tried to uh, work some additional overpay budget in, and so we're gonna be thinking about that as we consider this proposal. And, um, and there are a couple of items that administratively might, we might counter propose like uh, instead of a dollar an hour um, because of the administrative burden and how it has to work inside the system, we might come back and say, okay, we want to keep the spirit of it, but this is how it might work administratively. So there, there's a couple items that might be like that too. We are. As you can imagine, payroll can be very complex. And so we're looking for simplicity for administration, both to administer from the our side, but also from the employee side, easy to understand and predict. So if they have questions while they're running the numbers, which one of you guys do they reach out to? Jeremy? Okay, that's what we thought, but we wanted to verify. Okay. One other thing I think we mentioned, maybe I said this and I was zoning out, but um, it, you gave all those options. Could you prioritize those for us? So if we had to look at like not funding some of those, what those would be? and get that sent over, I guess, to Brian and Christine. That would be helpful as well. Yeah, it can be to Christine and just copy me. Okay. Another, another topic that kind of came up during the discussion was, do we need to create some kind of an advantage for applicants who have become dispatchers? Do you find that it's easier or you know people or it's a benefit to the applicant and the department if they've been, if they become dispatchers yeah, for a period maybe, of time? Maybe in such a way that you could forego the civil service for people who have been dispatchers for a little We don't while. have to have the answer today, we, but if yeah, you think about it, that out there. it seems to me we got a professional dispatcher operation at this point, and maybe that is kind of the... It's a, starting in dispatch, we, we always tell people starting in dispatcher, the jail is a uh, definite plus ahead of time, you one or the other or both. But if you get um, to forego the civil service, yeah. Right, we do, now we do have the loyalty points that were added into the contract already, um, where they can get up to five points. I mean, we could adjust that, make it just an automatic five if they pass dispatch training or or something a little bit different um, on that end, but we just, it's, we, yeah. we're struggling with recruiting also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that we got valid, good candidates, that have value and uh, yeah, okay. and, and we know it's a reality that some people are just they're either intimidated by a test or you know just that mechanism. So if we can find a different, an alternative way of finding somebody that has those kind of qualifications but maybe doesn't test well, um, and you know for somebody that is intimidated by the test taking process, maybe maybe go start a dispatch and and know that you're not going to have to take that test. But yeah, we'll yes. just throw that out there just chew on that. We don't have to obviously have any decision on that today. Um, so I guess that ends the discussion of item number six um, for today anyway. <laughs> we'll come back to that. And so if there's nothing else, uh, then I think we need to, we're ready to adjourn. Yeah, before we do that, I want to point out on the thing that Daniel's already approved, there, there does need to be guidelines developed for that. So I'll be developing some so we know who actually gets that incentive payment. So just know that there'll be something coming out at some point to describe that program a little more fully. I'll make a motion to adjourn. All right. Uh, motion on the floor to adjourn. Second. Second. Uh, with that being seconded, all in favor? Aye. The motion passes unanimously, and we are adjourned at 1029.